Episode 11, August the 22nd, 1914. I fired the first shot, an historic episode related for the first time by Sergeant E. Thomas, M.M. Read by Peter Downton. Not until the editor himself had visited the War Museum at Mons had he any idea who was the British soldier that fired the first shot in the Great War. But there he found documentary evidence which eventually enabled him to discover, on duty at a Brighton theatre, the fine military figure of Sergeant Thomas. His claim to have fired that fateful shot is now accepted, and it is a great editorial satisfaction to have secured from Sergeant Thomas himself the first account of this historic deed. It is rather odd that 24 years afterwards I should be asked to tell about how I fired the first shot for the British Army in the Great War. Of course, when I did that, I hadn't the slightest idea in the world I was doing anything of the kind, but it is officially proved, to the satisfaction of those in a position to judge, that I did have the distinction of firing the first of untold billions of shots that were discharged in the succeeding four years of terror and distress throughout the battlefields of the world. Only lately, however, has there been any sort of interest shown in the fact, and, at the time of writing, under the lead of my old regiment, the 4th Royal Irish Dragoon Guards, a memorial will be erected at the spot where, on this historic occasion, I pulled the trigger of my rifle. The strange thing about the episode was, as far as I can remember, and it seems as clear to me as if it took place last week, that I had not the slightest feeling of being in battle. Not the remotest idea that I was taking a very active part, as far as rifle fire was concerned, in what was to become the greatest war of all time. It seemed to me like an ordinary action taking place in peacetime manoeuvres, until the bullets started whizzing around me, and my shot certainly brought down an enemy who was no dummy. My regiment left Tidworth for Southampton, embarking at noon on August the 15th, 1914, on HMT Winifran, and disembarked at Boulogne the following day. After a few days' camp, Hull Point was reached by train on the 19th. We pushed forward, with no sign of the enemy. C Squadron, to which I belonged, was then detached from the regiment, and sent forward on reconnaissance. The squadron moved forward to Saint-Denis, where we stayed the night, sending out patrols. I need not say anything more of the cavalry advance to Mons, as that had nothing to do with the critical moment I am going to describe. But it so happened that on the morning of August the 22nd, 1914, when the countryside was flooded with the loveliest sunshine, its level rays making the haystacks in the spreading fields alongside the Mont Road stand out boldly with their long black shadows to the west, that I, being a member of C Squadron, 4th Royal Irish Dragoon Guards, was waiting on the south-east of the road, near to and almost within the shadow of the Chateau de Gislaine, under cover, when one of our scouts reported, Enemy coming down Main Road. Major Bridges, DSO, now Lieutenant Sir Tom Bridges, gave the order, Fourth troop dismounted, ready for action. First troop behind, draw swords, ready to go. I can recall no tremendous sense of battle, or ferocity of encounter even at that moment, or anything that seemed more exciting than one of peacetime manoeuvres. I saw a troop of Uhlans coming leisurely down the road, the officer in front smoking a cigar. We were anxiously watching their movements when, quicker than I can write here, they halted, as if they smelt a rat. They had seen us. They turned quickly back. Captain Hornby got permission to follow on with the sabre troop, and down the road they galloped. My troop was ordered to follow on in support, and we galloped on through the little village of Casto. Then it was we could see the first troop using their swords, and scattering the Uhlans left and right. We caught them up. 
Captain Hornby gave the order. Fourth troop, dismounted, action. We found cover for our horses by the side of the chateau wall. Bullets were flying past us and all around us, and possibly because I was rather noted for my quick movements and athletic ability in those days, I was first in action. I could see a German cavalry officer some 400 yards away, standing mounted in full view of me, gesticulating to the left and to the right as he disposed of his dismounted men and ordered them to take up their firing positions to engage us. Immediately I saw him, I took aim, pulled the trigger, and automatically, almost as it seemed instantaneously, he fell to the ground, obviously wounded, but whether he was killed or not is a matter that I do not think was ever cleared up or ever became capable of proof. That was the first shot that was fired by a rifle in the British Army, and I cannot repeat too often that at the time it seemed to me more like rifle practice on the plains of Salisbury. In one respect, however, and within a second or two, it was mightily different. From every direction, as it seemed, the air above us was thick with rifle and machine gun bullets, the whistling noise of them and the little flurries of hay that they sent out like smoke as they hit upon the stacks that were all around and which were offering cover to the combatants, this was something rather different from our days of make-believe. Still, it was really astonishing how few were injured in this first affair of the cavalry. None of our men was hit by the enemy fire, which just shows you what a lot of bullets it takes to kill a man. Now this historic moment over, and the job that we had been appointed to do discharged, our sea squadron patrol under Captain Hornby safely withdrew, with five prisoners captured in the sabre charge, to our position at the little village of Castro, off the main road of Soigny. I was promoted sergeant on the field at Messines on November the 5th, 1915, and continued my duties with my regiment till 1916, when I transferred to the machine gun corps for the remaining period of the war. I had the good luck to come unscathed through the four long years of war, I was awarded the Military Medal for Bravery in the field. I am also proud to say I was mentioned in Sir John French's dispatch for distinguished service in the field, dated May 31st, 1915. On the disbandment of the Machine Gun Corps, I returned to my old regiment and served until my time expired in 1923. My happiest years had been passed in the service, and yet I must not say that because I had been happy enough in my retirement and glad to have had the good fortune to serve my country and to go through all sorts of dangerous situations throughout the four long years of war with nothing more serious than an attack of PUO, whatever the medical term for that is. However, the attack for me earned a few weeks rest in Manchester General Hospital. I was born in the army. My father was serving in the Durham Light Infantry. I myself joined the army at Kirky, India in the Royal Horse Artillery, being 14 years of age, and transferred to the cavalry when I was 16. When the Great War broke out, I was already an old soldier, for despite the fact that I was then only 29 years of age, I had already seen 15 years service. Another thing possibly worth mentioning is the fact that this first shot was fired not by an ordinary trooper, but by a bandsman, as my actual position was that of a drummer. I find lots of people think that the bandsmen are not soldiers in the ordinary sense, but they are quite wrong, for every bandsman has got to do his military duties, in addition to his musical ones, and the moment war comes, he has to turn from his musical instrument to his weapon of battle. It was a big change for me and my pals of the band of the 4th Royal Irish Dragoon Guards who were playing at Southampton on August 4th, 1914 when we had suddenly to return to headquarters and prepare for the stern business of war. Thank you.
Oh.